And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. Our special guest author is Dr. Paul Thigpen. His new book is Manual for Spiritual Warfare. It's great to see you again. It's been great a number of years, uh, you know, since we, we've done a few books in the past, going back to, I remember one, The Rapture Trap. Yes, uh, it's been some time. And now something else, uh, what have you been doing? I know you were, you were doing some stuff for OSV for a while, and now this is published by TAN. Are you working with them? Yes, I am. I'm editor for the TAN imprint of St. Benedict Press. Right? Okay, great. And uh, let me ask you, so where you, you're living in where, North Carolina now? Where are you? North Georgia. North yeah, Georgia, okay. Near the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. It's beautiful. Okay, okay there. great. Now, who's Father Neil, and why did you dedicate this book to him? He's my pastor okay. and one of the most wonderful pastors I've ever had. And the little parish I'm in there, St. Luke's, is the most incredible. And where's, where's Father from? Looking at his last name. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. He actually was born in Toronto, but his parents are from India. Okay. Dabliwala, Father okay. Neil Dabliwala. Okay. So whose idea was it? I mean, for you've written a couple of different books. Manual for Spiritual Warfare. You're, you feel like... We're here today. Now, you, you, you originally were Pentecostal at one point in time in your life, a Methodist Pentecostal. Uh, I mean, are you going back uh, to your roots here? I mean, are, we, are Catholics really into spiritual warfare? I mean, we hear it once in a while in Scripture. You know, Paul pops up with something here and there. But, I mean, is this really a major focus? We all remember the movie The Exorcist. There's been a couple of exorcism movies here and there. You know, Raymond has William Peter Blatty on his, uh, you know, on his, on his show or something. But are, is spiritual warfare really something that we as Catholics here in the 21st century should be concerned about? Well, you know, it's uh, first just starting with the gospel. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, what's said again and again is not just that he teaches, not just that he heals the sick, raises the dead, but that he casts out demons, and he does it again and again. And from the very beginning, you look at the early apostolic ministry, you look in the book of Acts, you look at the, the first generation of the Christians after that, uh, how common it was. It was actually, exorcist was actually one of the, the stages in ordination mm -hmm. toward the priesthood. And it's been a consistent part of the church's teaching and experience down through the ages. As you know, folks who look at the book will see, mm -hmm. have a number of anecdotes from the, the lives of the saints. Right, and right. Things. But part of what we have to understand is that the, the we have to distinguish between what we would call the ordinary activity of the devil and the, the extraordinary activity. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. you, you do Exa exactly delineate in, here. in the book, right? And most yeah. of my book is actually about the ordinary activity. I, I right. talk about the extraordinary stuff. That's the stuff that Hollywood likes to latch on to and try to sensationalize, things like possession and oppression right. and right. infestation of buildings and that kind of thing. And that's important to know about and I, I talk about it when I lay that out. But that would assume that's also the rarest, right? It is, although the exorcists I talk to say it's becoming less rare. And, and, is, and why would that be the case? Because people are, and you talk about opening themselves up to it more? Well, two things they seem to agree on. One, the ones I've talked to. One is that people are doing more things that do open doors. So they're, they're more involved, more people involved in the occult. Mm -hmm. You know, that the movie about the Ouija board just a few months ago after right. that, even though that movie told the story of the Ouija board opening a demonic portal, so to speak, um, even though it was basically, it could have been taken as a warning, uh, sales of Ouija boards spiked for right. Christmas gifts. But that, um, <clears throat> some very serious for kinds of, of all things. Of all right. things, yes. Right, right, right. Um, some very serious kinds of sin can open up to that that are more common now. But, but what I'm hearing is that in addition to that, the folks are opening themselves up more, is that more folks are being secularized. Mm -hmm. they, they, the very weapons that we have that I talk about in the book, as Catholics especially, to, <clears throat> to fight the devil and the, the, the armor that God gives us are the things that they've lost. Like prayer and fasting. Prayer, fasting, the sacraments, right. especially the scripture. Uh, you look at Jesus in the wilderness, how does he, when the devil comes to him, how does he parry with him, with, with the scripture? Right. And, uh, and they've forsaken all those things. They've abandoned them. So they've, so many people, at the same time they're inviting in the enemy, they are making themselves totally vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, uh, in many ways, like you said, they're inviting him in an already weakened condition to begin with. And not knowing once he comes in what to do. What, they have, what, they have what's no idea. what's yeah. to do. Yeah, now it's broken up into two parts. Part one is preparing for battle, and part two is aids in the battle. Uh, what made you decide to break it up that way? Well, I, I wanted to kind of lay the foundation for people to understand there's, there's not a lot of teaching today, at least in Catholic circles, about spiritual warfare, even though you have that, <clears throat> excuse me, the terminology of St. Paul that, that kind of helps to undergird the, the stories we see in the Gospels. So I wanted the first part just to kind of lay out what, what is a demon, what is, who is Satan, what does the scripture say about this, what does the church tradition say, 
Uh, what are their strategies? Because the first thing you got to do is know your enemy when you're mm -hmm. in a war. A lot of folks don't even realize they're in warfare. Know your enemy, then you've got to know his strategies. What, what's the battle about? And then to go on and talk about, okay, who's your commander? Of course, Jesus Christ, and mm -hmm. he's already won. Uh, who are your comrades? A lot of folks don't realize they can call on the saints, the angels, especially right. the Blessed Mother, and they can call on each other as well here on earth. Then to take it from there, what are your weapons? Things like sacraments, scripture, prayer, mm -hmm. fasting, Eucharistic adoration. What is your armor, defensive? And scripture talks about that. We have the virtues. As we grow, develop the virtues in our lives, we're making ourselves less vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. Right. Well, you say uh, belief in Satan's existence and activity is today widely dismissed as an outdated superstition. So, the first thing. Second, even among those who recognize the enemy's activity, few are aware of the resources available to combat him. And third, though it's true that at times our struggles with the flesh and the world may not be directly provoked by the devil's interference, still he takes advantage. I thought this was very interesting. Still he takes advantage of those struggles and seeks by the way of them to establish a stronger presence in our lives. So again, we're not saying that everything that happens to you that ends up being bad or your things are going wrong that somehow you're being oppressed by the devil, but those kinds of struggles could put you in a position where you're more easily tempted, right? Yes, and when we talk about the ordinary activity of, of demonic powers, basically what we're talking about is temptation, mm -hmm. which every Christian has, every non-Christian has. And <clears throat> when we begin to understand that, that the subtle way, this kind of stealth strategy of the enemy for most of us, we may, most of us may never have to worry about exorcism or infestation or oppression, but every one of us will have the enemy try to plant thoughts in our mind. Mm -hmm. And he will try to deceive us. He's the father of lies. He will try to discourage us. He will try to confuse us. He will try to uh, put doubts in our head. He will try to provoke us mm -hmm. to the passions like lust or anger or avarice. He will try in, <clears throat> in all these ways to pull us away from God. And we don't always recognize that the thoughts are coming from outside us. They seem more like our thoughts. That's interesting. You mentioned that. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I know you mentioned Well, that demons before. don't have bodies. They're, they're mm -hmm. purely spiritual beings. They're angels. They're fallen angels. And so they can, most of the time we mm -hmm. know that someone is that we're getting information from outside or a thought comes to us from outside of us right. because it comes through our senses. Mm -hmm. But what if the thought bypasses your senses and goes straight to your, to, into your head? Right. Then you have a hard time sometimes saying, is that my thought? Or you just automatically assume it's your thought when actually someone else might have dropped it in there. Right, so what does it need to be tested? It needs to be tested. You, you, know, you have to think about the, the food of it. You have to put it in the context as I you know, tried to do in the book of realizing that often uh, what he's doing is, is trying to dangle something in front of us that in itself is good and may even be mm -hmm. that, that God would want for you, but to give you a shortcut that involves disobeying God. Hmm. You look at what happened in the garden when he says you will be wise like God, knowing good and evil. That's a good thing. You know, you'll be like God. That's a good thing. St. Ambrose, I think it was, pointed that out many centuries ago, that the devil, no wonder it resonated in Eve when he said, you can be like God and you can know good and evil and be wise. And, and she's thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because God made her to be like him. Mm -hmm. That's the point. But, but then the devil says, mm, and the shortcut to do that is to disobey him. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. You get, a, you get in the wilderness. You know, of course, remember, you want right. people to worship you, Jesus, and all that stuff. So jump off the temple and right, right. take a shortcut. And, uh, and that's often what it is. So you have to kind of that's put it in those That's interesting, that idea of the shortcut, <laughs> taking the easy way, trying to bypass what it really takes to have happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I hadn't really thought of it that way as well. That's it's one of the ways anyway. Yeah, He'll do right. other things too. He, for instance, you look in the garden, and you have to. You can look at what he said to Eve in the garden, and what he said to Jesus in the, the wilderness, mm -hmm. and, and basically right. You see the same. your whole thing. Yeah. Well, his playbook is pretty straightforward, it, it isn't is. it? Right. So you plant the doubts. He doesn't say, um, you know, well, God said so and so, but he says, did God really say? Mm -hmm. And then he tries to plant a doubt about God's character, where he says, uh, oh, he doesn't. That's not the reason he told you. It's because you're his rival. He doesn't want you to be like him That's because right. then you'll know like him. Same with Jesus. He says, if, he doesn't say, you're the son of God, do this. He says, if you're the son of God. Mm -hmm. Very subtle way to try to plant a doubt about whether he's the son of God or not. Mm -hmm. And doubts are one of the ways he comes at us. Well, it's interesting, too, because obviously you talk about him be the, the great deceiver. Mm -hmm. The idea, one of the great deceptions today is that he doesn't exist. That's one of the ones. And the other one, which, which I, you talk about in the book, which I, I always remember coming to terms with, is the idea, he's the tempter and then he's the accuser. 
Yes. So he first gets you to do something you shouldn't do, and as soon as you do it, he accuses you of what a terrible person he you are. He comes at you from both directions. That's right, right. Exactly. Now, one of the things that's interesting in this book, it almost reminds me of, you know, it's, it's like a prayer book, mm -hmm. and remind me of, you know, like a missile almost, picking it up, just the style of it. And, and then, as you said, the second part offers aids for the battle, church documents, scriptural texts, words, anecdotes from the saints, et cetera, as you mentioned. But this was, I thought, important because sometimes we've heard about these deliverance ministries and, you know, you know, we're not, we're not sitting here promoting that a bunch of lay people from the parish should get this book and decide they're going to be casting out demons around town, right? You say, for this reason, the book is for private use and its prayers are not intended for use in public deliverance ministry, nor is it intended for use in performing exorcism, which can be legitimately carried out only by priests. You know, that is a concern. I know that's come sometimes people will go either too far where they start to believe that everything going on in their life is something that the devil is 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 doing uh, as opposed to maybe realizing that they have some culpability too. Yes, the scripture says plainly the flesh, the world, and the devil. Those are the three uh, directions from which these things come. And so uh, that's uh, one of the things I've heard about the book that I'm very happy is people saying it's very balanced. And mm -hmm. I've tried to do that. It's not sensational. It's not the kind of thing, if you read it, you're going to go to sleep and have nightmares tonight or, or stay up awake because you're afraid. And it's certainly none of the prayers in it are prayers that, uh, that only a, an exorcist should be praying or only a, a priest should be praying. Well, the prayers that are in here, any, anyone can pray. Right. You say, Christ referred to demons on more than one occasion and casting evil spirits out <laughs> of those who were possessed was a striking and indispensable aspect of his mission. Of course, some interpreters have claimed that when Christ cast out evil spirits. He was simply healing a physical or mental disorder misunder misunderstood as demonic possession. And that's where you get a lot of people today saying, well, we know what it said there and what Paul said, but the, the, we, modern science, you know, we, we know so much more. But at the same time, the church is always very careful with the idea that if the first thing is to make sure that the the, the natural aspect of why one person is suffering is ruled out first, right? Always. If you go, so I encourage people to go to a priest. They, they know that they're supposed to start out ruling out anything that, any medical or other explanation, psychological. And it's only, only after you've been through that that they will consider the other. Well, you, you quote here, Father Ronald Knox once Riley noted, it is stupid of modern civilization to have given up believing in the devil when he is the only explanation of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I could think we can look right now to a certain part of the Middle East where horrible things are being done to, to all kinds of people, you know, crucifixions and, and babies being beheaded and horrible things. Uh, I don't know how to explain that apart from the devil. I really don't. Now, you talk here a little bit about the idea, obviously, just how many demons are there. We simply don't know for sure. Sacred Scripture and tradition take for granted there are multitudes of them, but we can be consoled to know that their numbers aren't increasing. And also that their angelic nature includes certain kinds of superhuman powers. And this was something, I, I, again, that, that struck me. The angelic nature of demons, though, in many ways superior to ours, has been deformed and darkened by their sin. And according to the prevailing tradition, the devil and his cohorts cannot know the future unless God is revealed. I think that a lot of times that's what people aren't sure about. They're trying to figure out how powerful are these demons? You know what I mean? How much do they know? Do they know your future? Can they hear your thoughts in your head to know whether, in fact, their temptations are working? How does that work? You know, it's been debated, and that's why I'm careful you know, to say there it's not a settled issue. But the majority, I would say the majority opinion in the church has been, number one, that they don't, can't know the future. All they can know is things that they intend to do, just the same way with human beings. And then they can't, that they can't read your thoughts, but that they're very good at reading body language. Mm -hmm. And you get this especially among the, the ancient fathers and mothers of the desert. And they talk about how <coughs> the, the enemy can watch you. And, you know, we, we know today because of science that, uh, that if you see something that's really attractive to you, the, the pupils of your eye. Right, they, they can follow For instance, that. Right, they can right. follow even things like that. Right. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's, that's a good thing to know. They can't exactly read your thoughts, but they can certainly put the thoughts in there. Right. And in the section here it says, and this is one thing I was thinking too, you, you talk about obviously we all know that the, the Satan's only a creature, in the end he's no match for God as creator and judge, and then right there you have a subtitle that says, why is the devil still in action? And that's the thing, well if he knows he's, lo he's lost, why is he still bothering? He wants to get <clears throat> back at God, you might say. Mm -hmm. He can't do it directly. So who does he go after? He goes after God's kids, his children. 
uh, he, he goes after the image of God in order to deface it. The, the ancient fathers used to talk about how uh, <clears throat> there, there was a time, for instance, when, uh, when the emperor did something really awful and the people of the town rose up and they couldn't get their hands on the emperor. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They went to the statue of him and right, they, okay. defaced, they defaced the image okay. of the emperor. And <clears throat> we saw the same thing happen with Saddam Hussein's statue. After, after he fell, they, they destroyed the statue. Right. That was their way of expressing that. But also, what, what if the statue is also the child, you know, the son or daughter of God? Mm -hmm. Let's pull down as many as we can to hell with us, not only right. because misery loves company, but because that way we get back at God, the only way we can. Right, right. Yeah, and we talked kind of about the deception and then accusation. The third one, the devil tempts us through doubt as he seeks to diminish our faith. It strikes me that, that that's, a, that's a powerful one today, isn't it? Oh, it is, and it has, I mean, the, the doubt. <laughs> yeah, our culture is, is a doubting culture about so many things. Unfortunately, they put, put too much faith in other things like science or personal experience or that kind of thing. Uh, in the end, um, everybody, somebody's fool, you might say, and, mm -hmm. and everybody uh, trusts completely in something. Right. And uh, so it's not that, that Christians are all naive and, and gullible in their beliefs. Everybody believes in something. But unfortunately, our culture has lost its for the large part, believe. Well, well, there's a difference between being a Christian who believes in science and being and something who believes in scientism or something. Exactly. Yeah, the you science know. can always, which is one of the points I'm making there when folks say, well, science doesn't show us anything right. about demons. And say, well, let's think about what science does. It measures time, space, matter, motion. Um, demons don't have physical bodies. They live outside and they, of They live outside of They can can't influence. Get them in a, they can influence can't put them in a things. test tube, as you right. say. So you can't right. put them in a test tube. You can't uh, put them under psycho, psychoanalysis. You also say, you talk about tempt us through enticement, and finally demons can tempt us through provocation. They can plant thoughts or arrange circumstances that make it more likely to be stirred to pride or anger or lust or even despair. And that reminds me of a little bit. I remember Mother Angelica used to always talk about the idea of avoiding occasions of sin, mm -hmm. in a sense of knowing yourself enough to know <coughs> that certain situations you're going to be more likely to fall. That so you don't go there to prove how strong you are. You avoid those things because you yes. realize that's a, a tough area for you. Yes, and 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 they know us well. You know, there's at least probably at least one demon assigned to each of us to, to look very carefully at everything and to know. And they notice the things that attract us. They see the things that provoke us to anger. They see the things that provoke us to greed, mm -hmm. to avarice. And so they, they know pretty well the, the buttons that they can push. And uh, we don't want to help them push those buttons. Right. And this is important. Note that in all of these forms of ordinary demonic activity, Satan is not forcing anyone to sin. So the devil didn't make me do it, right? That's right. He might That's have right. greased the skids for me to do it. Yes. <laughs> but he didn't make me do it. That's the old thing. And you talk about other things, that's a infestation, uh, and that's actually in a location. This is mm -hmm. one that, uh, you know, people might, oppression. You get into oppression, obsession, possession. They all seem, you know, it's tough to separate those out. But what about something like oppression? Describes demonic attacks on a victim's exterior life, influences on their bodily health, finances, work situation, family, and other so social relations may even include physical assaults. Now this is the kind of stuff you read it now and you go, I don't know about this. But then you read later in the book when you have some of the saints like John mm -hmm. Vianney and other Padre Pio talk about it and you realize that these great saints of the church, uh, you know, uh, have experienced this. And up to, to recent times, I mean, you know, Padre Pio was still alive when I was a kid. Right. And, uh, and yet this, the, the first-hand accounts we had of the things that he encountered uh, makes it very clear, and not just him, you know, but plenty of others in the modern world, that these are not some kind of medieval legends. Right. Now, one of the weapons you talked about here uh, is, is, like we said, prayer and fasting. And it says, if prayer is a spiritual weapon, fasting is the spiritual whetstone on which it is sharpened. It's the spiritual muscle that, when exercised regularly, strengthens the thrust of the weapon to pierce the enemy and drive him away. That's one of those ones, fasting, where I kind of say, you know, uh, fasting is a tough one for me. So it's kind of like, well, what's the point? But you're saying it's a wet It's something that helps you sharpen. How yes, so? it sharpens your prayer. It's, um, it's, uh, part of it's a mystery to me. But, you know, again, I come from a Pentecostal mm -hmm. tradition where fasting is very important. We actually, I was a part of a parish one time that as many people as possible who weren't sick or nursing mothers fasted all all solid foods for 40 days, really? 40 nights. Okay. And uh, I lost a lot of weight during that time. And you begin to find it does all kinds of things. It sharpens your mind. 
it um, every time a, a hunger pain comes up, it, it uh, if you let it, it, it can turn you to prayer. It uh, focuses you, focuses you in ways that uh, that you know, because part of the problem of modern life is that we get so distracted. We have so many distractions. So just in those ways alone, but I think at some spiritual right. level that we don't even fully understand, when you look at fasting in the scripture, it, the scripture talks about there's a power to it. Right, and I guess in some ways also it's another way your senses are being assaulted, in a sense, mm -hmm. by food and taste mm -hmm. and those kind mm -hmm. of things. And if you separate yourself away from that, that allows you to focus more, like you said. The way going to a place that's quiet yes, al exactly. allows mm -hmm. you to, uh, to focus. And again, you have... Uh, some of the things that uh, you know, Bernard Clairvaux talking about, you know, how important prayer is and take on any. And it says the weapons of sacramentals, of course, the first one, exorcism, that's the big one. But a couple ones for people I, I thought are interesting, like the sign of the cross, which I always think of people going into church and, you know, removing, reminding themselves of their baptismal, but also that idea of blessing, blessings and blessed objects. Uh, throughout the centuries, the testimony of many Christians, including a number of saints, confirms that objects blessed by a priest through the power of the church's intercession can repel demonic powers. They become, you know, they don't, they're not like sacraments and they, they don't, you know, bestow the grace that they, mm -hmm. that they signify. But I like to say they become an occasion of grace. We talk about an occasion of sin. Mm -hmm. For me, a sacramental is an occasion of grace. The, the prayers of the church through the blessing of that object are united to that object in such a way that if, if we are rightly disposed toward it, it becomes an occasion of grace right. for us. And I would think the children of the darkness are repelled by the light. And so whatever, <laughs> in a sense, is part of Christ and his church is going to be something that's very, you know, upsetting or troublesome to them. And, I, you know, I, can, I won't go into personal stories, but I can tell, since I've become Catholic, I've had a number of encounters and can tell you about situations in which things like holy waters or mm -hmm. holy water or blessed crucifix or other things, St. Benedict medal. Made a huge yeah, the St. Benedict medal. I know even, uh, I know at our house we have one of those St. Benedict medals mm -hmm. you, you hang over your, kind of over your front door. And uh, in the second section, it's all about, like I said, AIDS in the battle and scriptures for the battle. You've got that all laid out here. And so how is this book done? I mean, is this the kind of thing that there's a wide audience for something like this? Uh, my impression is there probably is. We were pleasantly surprised. It mm -hmm. sold out in the first two weeks. The first printing had to get some more. Um, yeah, it's been at the top of Catholic books and Amazon, bouncing around there for a while, and for of Catholic books. Do you have any uh, feedback so from so. people who have purchased it as to what their motivate? What was it in seeing this that they felt like a book like this would be helpful for them? Oh yes, I'm getting. That's that's what I was going to say. That's the best part. It's not just the number of sales, but the anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Uh, evidence of the book's usefulness is so satisfying to me. It's so that uh, people who, who felt they were losing the battle in some way now feel like they're they're better armed. Mm -hmm. People who didn't know the battle was even going on now feel like I'm, I'm aware and I can do something about it. Uh, I've gotten stories from folks saying, you know, my I just I just realized my son is is practicing white magic, mm -hmm. or or I've got a daughter who's been playing with a, a Ouija board, or I've got a parishioner who's been whatever, and. Uh, and it's making folks aware, and it's, it's giving them giving them the tools to, to make things different. Right, exactly. And, and it's kind of like with everything that we've seen. You know, I, I, I think of that terrible movie and that terrible book, uh, whatever, 30 Shades of Grey or whatever it is. Uh, just that idea that, again, it just shows you, you start with the venial sin. You start, you open yourself up to it. But the human condition is to continue to push the envelope. It always has to be more, 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 and different, different, different. And you find yourself at some place down the road which you never thought you would be yes. at. I, I like the uh, the analogy of, you know, I've, I've often said to somebody, you think you can sink a battleship with a teaspoon? No, well, guess what? If you put a teaspoon of water in it from the ocean and you keep doing it, you doing keep it doing it, forever. keep doing it, eventually it'll sink the battleship. And that's, that's how it can be with these things. There's a cumulative effect. I talk about right, it in there. Right. That they're like these, St. Teresa of Avila called them these poisonous little reptiles. Right, exactly. And they're, they're like little you know, snakes or little lizards that get into your house and you think, oh, no big deal, but they grow. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, they, and, they, and these are the kind of things that wear you down. You talk about being a prayer warrior and things like that. If you're not practicing the prayer and you're not fasting and you're not focused on these things, you can find yourself in a weakened condition where things that might not have affected you suddenly do. And of course they always say that you're your weakest when you think you're your strongest, right? Yeah, that's right. 
So the book is really, you know, it's it's a book about the enemy, but it's also a book about grace. How long did it actually take you to put it together? Well, I had the the, uh, the pleasure and privilege of actually using my, my full-time work hours mm -hmm. at TAN for doing it. So probably two months, I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us what project you might be working on now? Oh, I've got a great book about to come out to, with TAN. They have a series called A Year With Series. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Aquilina, Pat Madrid have done some with them. Uh, I just did one a couple of years ago uh, called A Year with the Saints. It's 365 okay, readings. Right. Okay. I'm doing one now, A Year with Mary. And so is that one of those daily reading kind of That's books? That's right. right. And these are all about Our Lady. And people like those because they're in small segments. I, I can feel like I can spend that much time because right. I wish we could say, we, but we're usually timing <laughs> ourselves to say. And if it's a good uh, reading, it's, it's the a thing bite. you can think about all, all day. Right, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Always great to see you. Doug, my great pleasure. God bless you. Everyone <laughs> you too, you too. Mr. Paul Thigpen, Dr. Paul Thigpen, and he is the author of the Manual for Scriptural Warfare, and it's published by TAN Publications. It's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. I think in a world we live in today, having information like this is vital. Check it out and check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.